Here comes the ABC of Chardonnay. Wait, hang on, didn't that once stand for anything but Chardonnay? It seems bonkers that this grape variety was once the butt of jokes, that it was once seen as something to be avoided when those in the know would crawl over broken glass to Burgundy just to lick the bung of a barrel of Montrachet. We're not here to put this grape on trial for past sins committed in the pursuit of rich, buttery indulgence. Some contemporary context then. Chardonnay is the most popular white wine grape in the world, grown in more regions than any other, and second in total hectares planted to the Spanish bulk wine and brandy grape, Irene. Que? Exactly. The world's most sought-after and expensive white table wines are Chardonnay, and Chardonnay makes more wine in Australia than any grape other than Shiraz. So it's no laughing matter. And we're going to have a serious look at options for turning Chardonnay grapes into wine. We're in Main Ridge on the Mornington Peninsula in Australia. This region has a cool maritime climate, heavily influenced by bodies of water on three sides, Port Phillip Bay, Bass Strait and Western Port. Chardonnay's ubiquity partly stems from the fact that it is able to grow in a range of places, cool, moderate, even warm, but it is, like Burgundy Bedfellow Pinot Noir, an early ripening variety. That doesn't just mean it can ripen here, it means that conditions such as these give a relatively rare chance to witness its texture and flavour at the cooler, leaner, racier end of the spectrum, in a wine that has that all-important balance. We're picking grapes for a single vineyard wine by a producer called On and On. It's a cold morning on the last day of March 2023. It's a steep, south-facing slope, a cool aspect, at about 170 metres altitude. Land prices and other factors here mean that growing grapes is seriously expensive. The wine will have to justify that. single slight Chardonnays are prevalent in a region like this because Chardonnay, much like Pinot Noir, has an intriguing knack of expressing the personality of the place where it's grown. The team is harvesting by hand. It'll take them all day to get through this and the adjacent Pinot block. There are a couple of reasons for hand picking. It gives them a chance to leave on the vine anything that doesn't make the grade. That's always important, especially so in a tricky season like this. It also means that the grapes can be pressed as whole bunches, otherwise the grapes would have to be crushed. No real problem with that, but in this instance, Will Byron of On and On says he doesn't want the extra tannins and lees, those broken down fragments of grape pulp skins and whatnot, that crushing would entail, especially as the juice will be run straight from press to barrel. Some years I quite like the stuff that's crushed, but typically there's a purity to the, the Chardonnay I'm making from a whole bunch pressing that I find, find really works stylistically with what I'm doing. And so the bunches go to the buckets and into the bins to be delivered to the winery. In many cases, winemakers are keen to do all they can to protect the grapes and juices from oxidation, to preserve freshness and aromas. Will, on the other hand, embraces a bit of pre-fermentation oxidation. With a non-aromatic grape like Chardonnay, this can allow a range of more savoury tones to develop in addition to straightforward primary aromas. The reason, in part, is that he finds no shortage of fruitiness in Mornington Peninsula Chardonnay. The challenge is to coax the wine into more complex areas. One of the secrets of Chardonnay's success is that it's malleable, open to a range of winery influences that will build its character. We'll get onto that later, but first, the press. With the help of French intern Maxime Daniel of Domaine Topnomerm in Burgundy's Cote d'Or, the grapes go from the bins up the conveyor to a small pneumatic bladder or airbag press. That bladder slowly expands to gently squeeze the bunches at the desired pressure, not so strong or long that we risk breaking the seeds or crushing stems. As Will said, the purity of that juice, which, sure, comes out a little murky, is important as he runs it to barrel. It could of course be fermented in another vessel made of, say, terracotta, ceramic, concrete or steel. Here's a batch of top-notch Chardonnay that Will's fermenting in the steel tank they call the Rocket. But Will has plenty of reasons for putting almost all of it into French oak. I tend to look at the, the barrel ferment versus a tank ferment as usually being a little spicier, maybe a little richer, and on the palate probably feeling a little denser. Will is also keen to include a lot of solids, not the season's dirt and dust, of course, but a good dose of the broken down cells from the skins and pulp, along with the fermentation leaves, the spent yeast cells once they've done their job of converting the sugars to alcohol, these solids will play a role in increasing texture and complexity. They help with the integration of fruit and oak and give rise to additional flavours in part because of their interaction with the barrel. They also promote freshness by scavenging oxygen, in turn dialing down the need for an oxidation-preventing dose of sulphur dioxide. You have the option of stirring those leaves too, batonnage is the French term, but Will's wary of the practice. He thinks the peninsula's relatively long growing season, the moderating influence of the nearby sea means the transition from summer to autumn is only gradual, tends to yield Chardonnay that is already fairly full in texture. If overdone, batonnage can introduce too much oxygen and give a heavier, duller wine. 
The winemaker has a choice whether to let the ferment kick off of its own accord, leaving its yeast present in the vineyard and winery to do the work, or to introduce a selected yeast strain to get the job done. There are pros and cons to allowing spontaneous fermentation, but Will is happy that the wine will already have enough mystery and complexity, so he opts to inoculate the ferment with a yeast strain that he likes. Also, because he's already given the juice some exposure to oxygen, he's keen for fermentation to get going now. And so the ferments tick along. Over time, they'll be checked, the pop and crackle, the smell, the taste, to make sure all's well. Towards the end, Will might give the lees a quick stir, in part to assimilate the last of the residual sugar. In the course of 10 days or so, the wine will be dry and left to mellow and breathe in these 228-litre French barriques. None of this is first-use oak, as Will wants the fruit to shine without those overt new oak flavours. Another choice that comes up here is whether to promote or inhibit malolactic conversion, also known as malolactic fermentation, MLF, or confusingly, malo. This is the process by which tartar malic acid is converted to softer lactic acid. Its chief function, then, is to temper the wine's acidity. Malic acid tends to have more bite, and winemakers may opt to retain it in a wine that already feels full and soft. Wines that go through malolactic conversion tend to feel slightly rounder, and there can be side effects such as notes of cream or yogurt. Some find these undesirable, but it's fair to say that the impact on aroma and flavour of malolactic conversion tends to be vastly exaggerated. It's also worth mentioning that its effect will vary depending on the wine. Even though the peninsula is small, sites vary widely. For instance, this main ridge vineyard was ripe for the picking five weeks later than Will's vineyard in Turong, just 20 kilometres away. The differences in acidity levels and the way acidity is perceived in the wine can be tremendous. All red wines will go through malolactic conversion, but peninsular winemakers adopt a range of approaches with Chardonnay. Some avoid it religiously, some do it sometimes, some always but to a limited degree. Some, like Will with this wine, will allow full malolactic conversion. He'd inoculate the ferments with a selected strain of bacteria that gets the job done without bringing other baggage. I like the flavours you get when you pick a Chardonnay a little leaner, so at a little less sugar content, but I don't love, I guess, sometimes the sour acid you can get from that, so I like to use my lactic fermentation, I guess, to balance that out. This will then stay on its accumulated lees until it's finally racked, moved from vessel to vessel, to prepare for bottling. The rationale here is to negate the need for sulphur because of the protective property of the lees, plus Will likes the effect on the Chardonnay of autolysis. That's where yeast cells are broken down by their own enzymes, and it's what gives champagne its brioche and biscuity notes. The barrels will be topped up once a week. That's when you refill them to replace wine that evaporates. It's important to stop Acetobacter feeding off the oxygen in the barrel headspace and turning this stuff into vinegar. In about 10 months' time, the wine will be fined with bentonite, a natural, fine-textured clay that will draw out any unstable proteins that might make the wine cloudy. It is then filtered to remove any other lingering deposit. Then it's ready to go into bottle, awaiting its chance to give people a taste of that far-flung main ridge hill and its harvest of golden berries. And fit, I reckon, to become one more compelling argument in favour of Chardonnay's number one white wine status.